my name is Melissa Basin. You can't see me. I'm just off screen. Um, I'm an instructional design specialist in the Academy for Teaching Excellence. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar event, which is part of Harvard College Tech Week 2020. So we're broadcasting over WebEx and are also conducting the event live in Academy, 3, uh, Academy in F315. Um, and we're recording this webinar for later viewing. Uh, WebEx is now available to all Harper employees at um, harpercollege.webex.com. And for more information, you can visit the Employee Technical Skills Training page on HIP. So this time, I'm very happy to introduce our panel moderator, Dave Rontre. Dave is a professor in Computer Information Systems and is the chair of the OER Task Force at Harper College. And Dave will help us introduce our panelists that we have with us today. So thank you so much for being with us, Dave, and thank you to all of our panelists. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Harper College has been officially encouraging and supporting the use of open educational resources for three years now. We've had two years of textbook transformation grants that have engaged 140 faculty members, impacted 34 courses, and almost 14,000 students duplicated headcount. Our students have already saved more than a million dollars in textbook costs. Student success is up 3% in OER-based courses. And one in five students has been able to enroll in an extra class because of their cost savings. Students report that they are more engaged in OER-based courses, and faculty indicate that their teaching is more innovative when they use OER. Our panelists today are going to share what OER means to them. If you would like to ask questions or share your own ideas during our discussion, please use the chat window. Let's get started. Please introduce yourself and your role at Harper College. Hi, I'm Joe Wachter. I'm a faculty member in the chemistry department. Kimberly, I'm Kimberly Polly. I'm currently serving as interim dean of math and science. I'm Kirsten Matthews, and I'm a professor in the psychology department. I'm Amy Kaminsky. I work in our information technology department as a training and client support supervisor. I'm Kim Fournier. I am coordinator of library collections. I also do work with copyright, and I'm library department chair. Great. Thank you. What is your experience with OER, and what does OER mean to you? Can I start? Sure. OK. Um, so my experience is uh, primarily that I worked to transform our Chem 100 course with Luisa Lemkow into an OER-based uh, course uh, using collecting some different sources from uh, OpenStax and some other uh, public publishers, and making a new uh, textbook for us to use through that. Um, what does it mean to me? To me, it's uh, primarily more about the open than the free part. I, I think that it's important that these things are out there, that they're available for uh, remixing, for revising, for collaborative um, evaluation, and that kind of uh, make sure that they remain relevant and that they can be changed and edited uh, going forward in, in the future. So my experience with OER is we transformed our elementary statistics class um, using OER materials a year ago. So I piloted those materials last spring, and we had all of our sections. We probably have like 25 sections of that class that ran in the fall that all used those OER materials. Um, and what OER means to me is that students now have access to better and free materials, which means on day one, all students have access to the materials that they need to be successful in class. Um, so the materials we used before, you know, they were like $150 for students, which meant a lot of them didn't have them on first day, but class starts first day, and there's assignments due, you know, day two or whatever. And so you've got students who always, they don't have access to those materials until way later in the course, which then influences their success in the course. OK, um, so I use OER in uh, both of my classes that I'm currently teaching, uh, Introduction to Psychology and Child Psychology. And I implemented in the intro class over the summer, this past summer, and then in the child psychology class in the fall. And um, what it means to me is, you know, it's a social justice component. It's the equal access, um, exactly as um, you just heard. 
So I look at OER from a little bit different perspective as a staff member here at the college. Um, what we look at at IT is finding resources for our faculty and staff to be able to continue to develop professionally in things like technology so that um, when you go into your classroom, you, you have the skill sets that you need to be successful in teaching with your students. So for us, OER is more of a how do we find free resources for technology to help with what we need here in the classroom. So my role with OER as head of collection development in the library is um, a little different. And there aren't a whole lot of people on campus who think about it the way I do. Um, so I'm glad for this opportunity to kind of express to you what's going on. Um, I have a much bigger view of open educational resources because I hold the purse strings. For, <laughs> I'm not kidding, for the library. <laughs> and, um, you know, I call it an academic bubble, but you guys are in an academic bubble. And you're accessing lots of resources that the library is licensing. You're also accessing things that we're tracking, um, repositories that are open access. But you don't realize what costs money and what doesn't cost money. Um, but I do. And frankly, um, the academic publishing market is out of control. And textbooks, you know, you know textbooks are way too expensive. Um, but the scientific journal publishing um, industry is out of control. And if you want to know how libraries are pushing back, take a look at uh, University of California. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about how they canceled their contract with Elsevier. So Elsevier is the largest scientific publisher in the United States. And the contract that you see had with Elsevier was $11 million. And 10% of the research that Elsevier um, publishes annually is from UC faculty. So it was their way of saying, we're not going to pay for scientific research that is government funded, that our institution is funding, and then we're publishing it through you, and then we're having to pay for it. It just doesn't make sense. So, um, and library budgets have been flat. I know your departmental budgets have been flat too. Um, you know, we've had lots of issues in Illinois with funding. So, I've been at Harper College 20 years, and I've been in this role about 10 years as head of collections. The budget has been flat for 20 years. So, imagine that. I remember when we had 16 millimeter film when we had slide decks, when we had cassette tapes, VHS. So I'm head of collections, and I am moving us through new formats. Now we're digital with the same budget that we had for 16 millimeter films. So I'm trying to provide access to support the entire curriculum with very little budget. And open access to me means that Scholarship is free and sharing knowledge and information. And that's what librarians do. We connect people to information, quality information. So that's, that's where I see this going. And I'm really excited. And I think it's a revolution. And I sound like a nerd. <laughs> but I, really, I really think it's an information revolution. And I want it on a t-shirt. And I'm really excited about it and very optimistic. <laughs> Kim says, I really like my job. <laughs> I really do love my job. And I am very, very optimistic, I will say. And I think um, a lot is changing. Some people will never notice what happened. But those of us that are in our academic bubbles will know that um, we will soon have access to more information, sharing of information. Thank you. Uh, several of you mentioned projects that you have worked on. Is there one project that you'd like to expand on and share? And I think we have slides available for some of those projects. Anybody want to start? So our, our book is housed at uh, chem100chm100.pressbooks.com. So you can all join, join in with that. And what we found was we teach this class, Chemistry for the Health Sciences. And it used to be the first in uh, chm100. Dot pressbooks com, And it used to be uh, a part of a sequence, a two-semester sequence. Uh, the health careers have changed their requirements over time, so it's now the only required class for most of these people. 
And so it doesn't, didn't really make sense to have it be this first half of a sequence that for the second one didn't even exist. Um, so we were changing this around and trying to find materials to use. And in this case, um, OER was something that was on my mind, but uh, we want, just from, from time and what we could do, we were first looking at what sorts of commercial things were available. And what we found was there was just nothing that, that met our needs. We tried a couple different textbooks, and um, they were just, you know, they were fairly expensive. We had to constantly be telling students, skip this, don't look at this part, we're not doing this, this thing doesn't apply to this class. They were really built more for the two-semester class, so it just didn't fit. So we started to think if we could put something together where it was a little bit more specifically what we wanted to do, and that's what kind of brought us to the um, OER resources because it allows you to not have to use a resource just as is because these, these things are licensed to be able to be cut and pasted and changed and rearranged and whatever. So we took about four, to five, uh, four different sources and compiled them together in a book. Um, and we, we can talk about this a little bit a few questions down, but we thought we found Pressbooks to be a really good solution where we could put everything together and um, if, you, if you go to read book, you can see what it kind of looks like. So that for, from the student's perspective, it doesn't look like they're reading different books. Um, everything kind of comes together. There's a table of contents um, on the upper left there. And you can go through and, and kind of look at everything as though it were one thing, even though it comes from, from different sources, uh, different OER sources. Uh, so that was our experience. And we've been using it now for, uh, this is the second semester that it is in full use throughout all the sections of that course. When you say you combine four different sources, you actually mm -hmm. selected right. chapters from four different sources rather than, so it's not four textbooks long. Correct. Right, right. So we found, <laughs> yes, it's not four textbooks long. So for instance, um, a big part of the chemistry stuff in here comes from the OpenStax chemistry textbook. But that textbook is made for a general chemistry course, which is above the level of what we would expect for Chem 100. So to just tell students, well, go read Chapter 2 from OpenStax would have been really confusing for them because they would have thought, oh, I have to do all these calculations and I have to do all this stuff. So instead, we pulled the sections that we thought were relevant and we put them in here and said, okay, these come from OpenStax. And, uh, you know, if you want to, the links are all still intact so they can go to the original textbook, find the original sources, but they know this is the part that applies to this class, and this is the part that doesn't. Um, we also incorporate a lot of organic chemistry and biochemistry in this course, but again, at a little bit lower level. So we found organic textbooks, a microbiology textbook that we also pulled portions from. Great, thank you. All right, so, um, so a year ago, we started working on an OER uh, solution for our elementary statistics class. Um, we have had this ongoing problem for many, many, many years in statistics with, um, with the existence of technology, but publishers of textbooks still wanting to publish a textbook that pleases everybody. So in trying to publish a textbook that pleases everybody, it really pleases no one. So these textbooks still would have, you know, all the by-hand computations that, you know, people used to have to make 100 years ago. And then it would have, like, as an afterthought at the end of a chapter, all the different ways you could use technology to do that. So whether it was a TI-84 or using StackCrunch or Excel or SPSS or R code, whatever it was. Um, but it was like little snick to bits at the end and didn't really incorporate throughout the rest of the text. Um, so it's been an ongoing issue because, like, like Joe had just said, we would, you know, we would tell students, like, they have this book because it would have problems in it that we would want them to do. But we're like, but don't read the book. Like, come to class and, like, learn how we're doing it here because we're going to show you how to do these things with technology, and the book doesn't really do that. Um, and then we would also have problems then with the online homework system because there would be, like, this nice little help me solve this button, and you would click it, and it wouldn't be very helpful because it would go through all the by-hand computations. And so something that should take them two seconds, you know, using technology would take them two hours if they mindlessly just followed what they saw on the screen. Um, and students didn't like it very much when I would remove that button, even though I tried to tell them that I was doing it as a favor, because I'm like, just look at what we did in class, and it will save you so much more time than to push that button. Um, so in going OER, we have been able to, um, we started with a textbook that already existed called Statistics Using Technology by Katherine Kozak. 
Um, that book incorporated the TI-84 and uh, R. Um, we did not want the R coding for our elementary uh, statistics majors. That would be just like another whole hurdle to have them try to learn. And so we took that book. It was in editable format. Um, and we cut all the R code out. We put in all the directions instead for Stack Crunch. And so now students have a textbook that every single thing on every single page is relevant to this course. We don't have to tell them, ignore page four, don't read this chapter, or whatever. <laughs> Everything in the book is actually relevant to them for this course. Um, and so we saw in the fall when all, so I piloted those, those materials last spring. All the sections of stats went to those in the fall. And just the performance on exams, performance on final exam, retention, everything was much, much better. And this has been a course that has been on the radar here on campus for quite a while because of its low retention and pass rates. Um, but like I said, this going OER with that class really, really helped with that. OK, so for my um, introduction to psychology course, um, I've been using a resource called the, the NOBA project, and it is a project that was created and funded by the Diener Educational Foundation, and the Deaners are emeritus professors from the University of Illinois. And it was a project that was designed specifically for a social justice purpose as a way to get introductory psychology materials into the hands of everybody um, without barriers. And it's very unique because, it, uh, first of all, it's modular. So it's standard textbook in psychology has these like 40 to 50 page chapters. They're really, really long, and they include so many different things. Um, the NOVA project includes over 100 modules, like little bite-sized pieces. So they're more like 10 to 15 pages on very specific topics. Um, the same topics you would get in a traditional textbook, except they're broken up in really nice ways. And each one is written by an expert in that subfield in psychology. So each one is by somebody with a big name or a graduate student of somebody with a big name, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so basically what they're able to do is say, here's what we think people should know about our field, um, you know, sharing to an undergraduate audience, which is really nice and it's unique. And I know that most other, um, you know, areas in academia don't have that project, but it's, it's really great. And so because it's modular, um, but it's all controlled within the same platform, all the modules follow exactly the same formatting. They all have instructor resources, just like a traditional textbook. They can all be printed individually in PDF form. And so they have all these um, options available to them that make it really, really user friendly. And so what I was able to do in my intro site class is pick and choose. You know, pick and choose the modules, um, mix and match them um, into the order that was appropriate to cover all the things that I think need to be hit on in an intro psych class. Um, some of that is going to be the same across other faculty in my department, because as a department, we're moving toward this resource. Um, but then certain details can be different. It gives us a lot of intellectual freedom to be able to customize our courses while still having um, a lot of the same key core modules that we cover. Um, and I have a, oh, there it is. Okay, so on the left, um, what you can see is uh, what is visible to a student who is just opening up the textbook. So um, over here, it just lists the modules in order. And I just pick and choose. You literally click a button that says edit, and then you drag and drop, and then you're done. You know, so um, that's all I did. It's really, really user friendly. Um, so that's what you see over there, just kind of the beginning. And then there's a series that I ordered. I gave them, you know, module names, or I gave them section names and then grouped the modules together. And then for all the modules that I wanted to put in there but we weren't going to cover in class or on an exam, I used the section title extras. And I just dragged and dropped <laughs> several extras just in case anybody was interested. Um, so that's over there, over there. On this side, what you see is if a student were to open an individual module. So it looks like a regular textbook. Um, there's a little summary at the beginning. There's a, a link for downloading as a PDF. There's a learning objectives introduction. And the, the chapter goes on from there with you know, pictures and links to video clips and other kinds of things. And then you know, there's a the, um, you know, little content there for the, for the module. The students don't have access to the, the test bank or the instructor resources or anything like that. But when I'm logged in, I have access to that straight through the module. So, 
Um, anyway, that's what um, I've been using and that's what um, other members of the department will be using for intro psych. And then I've used that same resource in my child psych, but there's not enough modules to pull together a full 200-level um, course in that. So I picked and chose the relevant ones and I supplemented with stuff that you have <laughs> provided. Um, so scholarly articles, because at a 200-level class I want them to be able to read um, scholarship within the field. and so. Um, I'm able to balance the more textbooky side of things with the more scholarly side of things, and, and it's worked really well. And the NOVA project is all free? Oh, it's totally free. Everything is, is, it's not only free, but it's really, really easy and they get it forever. So all they have to do to log in is um, an email address and a password, and that just allows them to have access to like printing PDFs and some other things. They don't even need that. If they didn't care about accessing a, a few of the, the things, you know, just to get the, the writing itself, um, you can just click on it. You can go to it just from the web. So, yeah. So with um, looking at it from an IT, Harper providing resources, OER perspective, we really have focused in the last year on our employee technical skills training page where we built um, Harper-specific curriculum um, for bigger software rollouts that we're doing. So right now, as many of you know, we're in the middle of doing our OneDrive transition. And mm -hmm. there is custom-made documentation that is very specific to how a Harper faculty member or staff member would need to move and migrate their data along with some resources from other open sources like Microsoft. Great. Well, thank you. I've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we on the question with uh, what, what question are we on? Three. Um, so the project that I worked on um, was with the community of practice for open educational resources. So there was a team of people, and um, this is mostly the work of Cindy Miller. She uh, wrote most of it, and I just put it up on the web. Um, <laughs> but we, we kind of collaborated in that she wrote it, and I connected it. Um, but it's a primer for Harper College faculty. So it's like how do I get started with this? What are you guys even talking about? What is OER? You know, um, is can I even? Is it even going to work for me? So these is like it's like an FAQ. So um, each of those accordion um, chapters is a flyout with more information on, um, you know, where do I find OER? How do you use Google to find OER? OER. What are the free open repositories? So I think that's um, helpful. The COP uh, sort of disbanded, I think, but. Um, that is something to revisit. Like, I, I feel like the faculty on campus need somewhere to go other than the two instructional, three instructional designers that we have um, when they need uh, assistance with. And Dave, of course, there's always Dave. <laughs> there's always Dave. <laughs> Dave's got into this <laughs> So I do think that librarians can play a role in this, too, um, connecting people to open information. So maybe we could collaborate on that. Um, and then with my background in copyright, um, I should say fair use, okay, because I'm really an advocate for fair use. Um, faculty often ask me questions like, how much of this copyrighted thing can I actually put into my open access thing? And how do I cite it properly? So I'm available for um, that kind of help, and maybe that should be a module as well. But um, there's, just, there's a lot to do yet, um, but I think the ball is rolling, the ball is jogging. <laughs> Going forward. <laughs> uh, I do want to expand on one thing that we've touched on but not really addressed, and that is how can you take something Cindy created and just put it on the Harper website? How can you take something from Open Facts and put it into your own textbook? And the answer is open licensing. It goes beyond the fair use. Fair use is I can take a copyrighted thing and reuse it for educational purposes, maybe. Fair, uh, open. Uh, licensing is instead of a copyright and all rights reserved, it is a copyright and you are allowed to reuse this under the following conditions. And the resources that you reused were licensed with uh, completely open, weren't they? Just with uh, the buy license? Yeah, the yeah. open stack license. The open stack with the, uh, yeah, the Creative Commons buy. So as long as you provided attribution to the source, you were free to use it however you wish. Is that the same Thanks, thing for? CC by. Okay, yes, CC by. Um, so that's not part of what we're talking about today, but I wanted to give some context to how are we able to reuse these resources. 
the original content provider said you could under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. So how do you overcome the overwhelming fear of finding material that's open? It's not scary. <laughs> There's no fear. Um, I mean, that's my job. That's my job. That's what librarians do, um, and we really enjoy it. It's a discovery process. That, you know, um, I guess it would depend on what information you're looking for. And you start with that. You, you guys have different information needs, and I would direct you to different places. Um, but I don't. I don't think it's scary at all. I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say it's not as scary as like you first think when you think about looking for source material for building new content. Um, technology is always changing, as many of you know. Um, and I think one of the things that you think about when you start thinking about all these changes is how overwhelming all these changes are happening at one time. Um, but there are so many resources on the internet and even here at Harper where you can actually get help and learn and grow as these technologies change um, with the idea of cloud software, so like going to OneDrive or using Word Online. These softwares can change instantaneously without anyone technically being aware. Um, and how do you make the, how as a user can you find resources quickly to make that change for the way the user interface looks. Maybe a button moved on you. How do you find resources? And I like to think about looking for places like from a vendor. So like Microsoft, for example, has a great training platform where it's free use. You can just go on. They have little videos that can show you how to do different things. Every time they come out with a new upgrade, they put like the cool new features on their site. Um, there are also like open community web chats with subject matter experts that are always there. I Google stuff all the time to try to figure out, you know, a problem or how do I solve something, um, or YouTube videos that show you exactly how to take something that you need and move it to where you need to go. I actually fixed my dryer by watching a YouTube video. <laughs> um, so it's out there. There's so many resources. And with a little time and patience, I think you can find what you're looking for. I think time is um, one of the biggest obstacles. Really. And even when you find a copyrighted resource, you can still use that as long as you link to it mm -hmm. rather than copying it. Correct. Several of you created combined resources and chose to host them somewhere. Why did you choose the platform you did to share your OER, and how did you go about learning and or mastering that technology? Sure. 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 Um, so that, it was kind of a big um, process for us because there were these things out there. There was OpenStack. There was uh, there's another one called LibreText that have this chemistry out there, but they were in this particular format that made it difficult to customize, to rearrange, to kind of do what we wanted. Especially with OpenStack, which their system is really built for that, but the actual use of that tool that they provide for that customization purpose, just I couldn't get it to work very well and it seems like it's an issue with their thing. So I was looking around for ways to share it. I definitely wanted to keep the idea of open educational resources, so I didn't want to hide everything in a Blackboard shell that would only be accessible to Harper uh, students. Um, that, that part of, of being a community-serving institution and being public-facing is important for me. Like, I stream all my classes live online to the world, and like, I want everything to be out there to everybody. So, um, so, so I was looking for around for tools, and Dave suggested this press book. So I checked it out, and um, it fit really well, and it answered a lot of our questions and solved a lot of our problems. So, for one, it was very easy to get stuff into press. You could simply copy and paste from the existing sources, and it would maintain all the formatting as well as the um, HTML tag, so that that allowed some level of customization. Like, for instance, all of the figures came with a figure tag, and so we could adjust the CSS to display the figures we wanted to without having to edit every single figure. Um, so those sorts of things were really nice. Um, also, the other nice thing about Pressbooks is I was 
hesitant about doing a bunch of work in a system that could potentially go away, you know, some startup or whatever that two years down the line doesn't exist anymore. Um, Pressbooks is based on WordPress, which has been around for a long time, and the system itself is free, uh, is open source, so that if the actual company, Pressbooks.com, were to fold, that system could still be hosted on another server. So it could, it's not somebody's intellectual property where the whole system is just going to go away. Um, so both of those things worked well. We found that it really worked in our committee to have one person who was pretty comfortable with the HTML coding backend part of it, and that was me to kind of make things look nice and fix things that were whatever, and have other, and then the other thing we liked about Pressbooks is that it has a, a what you see is what you get editor. It was very easy for people who were not very techy to get in there and change things and edit things and mess with formulas. Um, and uh, yeah, so we found that that worked well for us for what we were willing to do. I, um, I don't. I haven't talked to other people who have used that system, so I've, but I'm curious about other experiences uh, with it. How would you compare it to Blackboard? Um, oh, it's far better than Blackboard in, in every possible way. Um, <laughs> and that was just my point. Is yeah, yeah, it's easier to use than Blackboard. You know, there's so other if things. you can do Blackboard, you can do... If you can do Blackboard, you can do Pressbooks. The other thing that's so nice about Pressbooks is they really make um, a priority of making it look nice, which maybe is not the biggest, like, content-wise important, but, like, it makes a nice-looking book. You kind of thought up there, if they have their own typefaces that, are, that look like books, you can export to PDF, you can export to EPUBs and Mopi and all these other ebook formats. Um, so they're actually interested in making a thing that is nice to look at the way a textbook is. Because that's really, you know, a, a print textbook, that's just one really big advantage. If you open it up, it looks nice, it's, it's, at least especially in chemistry. These beautiful diagrams and pictures, they spent a lot of money on art to really, like, do this. And so I think Pressbooks has that same attitude. They want to make something that really looks nice, which I like. Thank you. I would say Blackboard that is the was, That was exactly what I thought when your book came up. I'm like, nice font. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm like, that is yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> 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 All right. Anyone else? Platform um, used and how it was to learn it? Sure. I, um, I wasn't so concerned with the technology piece of it because I was more concerned with the content. And so when I was looking at the various options, um, OpenStax and Lumen, and there's, there's some others, uh, that are out there. I, I just like the content of Nova the best, but it is super, super uh, user friendly, and I didn't need to pick and choose from different sources. Um, I was able just to use it modularly within in the same source. Um, so that's why I chose that. But especially in my 200 level um, classes, I wanted to make sure that I was able to replace all of the supplements that I had. So Nova has supplements, you know, it has video clips and other kinds of things, but I, I wanted more than, than that, and so I also made really heavy use of, um, you know, the library, so the Films on Demand, um, and so then I, I use Blackboard for that, so all of my, the, the link to Nova is on Blackboard, but also the link to every single clip that I show um, into Films on Demand or onto YouTube um, is organized with all the modules that I do, so um, that's, that's how I used it, and how I learned the tech was just trial and error. Thank you. That's kind of an issue that I um, need to work on is, yes, we have our licensed resources like Films on Demand or Videotips. Do you use the Videotips for psychology? I haven't yet. Okay. Um, I'll show it to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how do we integrate library resources with Blackboard? You know, I, mm -hmm. I see in Blackboard it's real easy to add a YouTube video and whatnot, but these streaming resources that we're paying for, it's just like nobody can find them. Nobody knows they're there. Mm -hmm. So how do we connect faculty to these resources? I will have to meet or something. Mm -hmm. That's a good lead into our next question. What resource would you most want others looking at OER to know about? I'll start. I think um, just the OER team in general here at Harper, I think they do a great job of helping out. Um, I know even from the IT side of things, when I was building some content that I had talked to Dave and some others just about, you know, what are best practices, how should I go about doing this so it's user-friendly, even though for uh, 
us in the IT department with our training materials, most of it's on the HIP in a PDF format right now. But we're looking even to continue to grow how we are producing our content to help our users out. Um, and I think working with subject matter experts, from my perspective, like when I don't understand something, I go ask. Here at the college, we're very blessed with having so many different subject matter experts in so many different areas that I think it's a really great resource that you could go, hey, I heard you did this. Can you help me with what I'm trying to do? And it's amazing the resources we have here at the college. Um, if I could just jump in and say something. And I just learned this this morning. That's what I love about open access. Like you're constantly learning. <laughs> everything's there. Um, so at um, UC uh, California, uh, their, their academic senate has an open access policy. So I think at Harvard College, we need to get our faculty senate together, and we need to come up with an open access policy. And theirs has rights and principles, um, call to action. So there's a model out there that I think we can follow where we educate our faculty that you know anything that you're writing or producing, Please consider publishing it open, you know. And like someone just said, what are our best practices? You know, we should get those best practices down. Thank you. Anyone else? So I'll go next. Um, so I know. Um, so in the area of, of mathematics or the sciences as well, or other um, subjects where there's lots of numbers, there's a hesitation to go to OER because the thing that people don't know how they're going to replace is that online homework system that they've uh, come to love or somewhat love. Um, <laughs> and so for, it, for us within the math department and with the staff class, we are using MyOpenMath. And MyOpenMath is free to all students. It is so super easy to integrate with Blackboard and some of the other like desired, what is it, desired to learn? What's the other one that's out there? It's like D2L, whatever that is. Um, some of those systems where um, it just integrates seamlessly, where students just click on an assignment and it like opens right there in Blackboard as if they've never left Blackboard shell and they don't need any special logins to get in there. Um, but MyOpenMath already has just, there are courses already created there in every aspect of physics and chemistry and every level of mathematics and accounting and business classes. And there's just this plethora of problems already there that you can pull in and edit and create and, and so on. And so, um, so for anybody who wants a, an elementary education or the elementary stat level class, um, in my open math, the course ID is just 51181. And in there, there's you know, the free textbook, there's free videos, there's the free online homework system. And that was another place, too, where we could customize the online homework system to be what we had always wanted to our publishers, but, was, but we were just never able to get. Um, we wanted, when students went to help me solve this or something to give them a hint at something, we wanted it to look like how they had been taught the material in the classroom. We wanted them to see the technologies we were using. We didn't want them to see 10 pages on how to compute a standard deviation by hand. Um, and so we were able to do that through the system. We also wanted its statistics and, you know, all of, and so we wanted real world problems with real world data. And so we didn't just want those problems of here's 10 made up numbers, compute a mean, median, and mode. Why do we care? I don't know because there's no context for this thing. Um, so we were also able, and the statistics using technology book had great data sets and lots of um, real world applications for things. And so um, we built a set of problems around every single problem in that textbook um, with those real world data sets. Um, and so it's relevant to students. They're interesting problems. They're, they're concluding things in context. Um, they're having to not just compute numbers, but within, you know, they're having to identify the variables and the type of variables. And they're going to, and they have to, you know, there's pull down menus for filling the blanks on the sentences because they're not just writing a sentence in there, but it's still far more robust than the online homework system that we had in the past. And, and like I said, we saw a difference when it came to um, the writing they had to do on unit exams and on our departmental final. Uh, they just had far more practice with that through what we had created in My Open Math for an online homework system than they did in any other publisher piece that we had had before. Great. What has been the best thing about your OER experience? Anybody? I can go. I can go. 
Um, so I think one of the best things is the freedom it's given me, and I've already described that. But something I haven't mentioned is that, um, and I was kind of surprised about this, is that I didn't get any questions or excuses from students about not having the, um, the resources for the course. And it used to happen with a regular textbook that it would be like a month or two months in, you know, or it might even be like past the drop date, and then a student would reveal they didn't have the textbook. Sometimes just because they didn't get it, and other times because they couldn't get it, and um, that, that's not an issue. And so now I feel like I know that they know that I know that it's on them. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, like if they haven't done the reading, they know there's not an excuse for that related to me. You know, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing that I can do other than provide them the resources. So that was actually a really nice surprise, and I kept waiting for the email, you know, about, about resources, and, and they never came. And in fact, I had one of, one of my students in my 200 level class was so into OER, she really, really liked it. And I didn't know she had done this, but she had um, given a speech on it for her speech class. And then she had gone to all of her professors and was telling her professors, and some of them knew about it, and some of them didn't know about it, and um, was really trying to teach faculty you know, about OER. So she was really into that and had talked to other students in the class and had collected some un informal data without me even knowing it. And it was 100%. The students really, really um, loved it. And they said they were more likely to do their readings. Um, they liked, for the particular resource I'm using, which is similar to something you said, everything that they're reading was relevant as opposed to a big, long chapter where we'd cover part of it, but we wouldn't cover all of it. And so they, um, they responded really well to that. So. And Harper College has technology mm -hmm. available for students. Uh, in the library? Where, where is that now? You know, I know we have laptops available for oh, students. In the library. Yeah. In, the in the library. library. So <laughs> if you have a student who, you've got a free resource that's mm -hmm. available electronically mm -hmm. and the student says, but I don't have the yeah. electronics available, we do have that available for students. They can... Uh, Chromebooks they can check out for an entire can. semester. Also yeah. calculators. Yeah, and so we have them technologically or if a student doesn't have consistent access um, to Wi-Fi or something like that, they can print. You know, and they have a, they get a whole ream of paper they're allowed to print during the semester, and so um, that's another option for them too. I don't know that any of them have done that, but it is something that they can do. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Best thing about your OER experience? So I was so the very first day of class when I was piloting these materials, we were just going through things, and I had to make sure that I emailed everybody to let them know that they were not to buy the book that was in the bookstore for the other sections. That you know they would be. Uh, my testing subjects, so to speak, for this new resource. Um, and I would be taking feedback from them all semester long also, which was great to like edit and things on the fly or to, you know, we can use some more things here. This wasn't quite clear here so that we could, you know, get those things in place before the fall. But, you know, the first day of class, students are usually pretty quiet. You know, you kind of run through your syllabus and try to get started and have them do some group discussions. But, you know, the first day is kind of quiet. But just going through and just talking about the fact that we were going to be using this free textbook, the students started clapping in the back of the room. <laughs> and at first, at first it took me a little bit by shock because I was thinking maybe he was just being a bit sassy or something. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he was just, he was truly, truly thankful because the fact that, because he was, you know, because he was a student that did not buy any of his books for any of his classes prior to showing up to class and trying to figure out, do I really need to get that book? Or how long can I hold off on a, you know, if there's no assignment due for another month, maybe I can hold off before I get that book. Um, and so he was just really, truly thankful that this was going to be a course that he had to spend zero dollars on textbooks for. Um, and I want to talk to you because I have a feeling we might share a student because oh. I had a student also that like was really on this OER campaign across <laughs> campus after this, and uh, she had asked me if I could go talk to her other instructors because there was there was a half to course that she needed to graduate for the next semester. It was a three credit class, and the book was three hundred and sixty dollars. Um, and so she was like putting off this like one half to economics. I'm not going to say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's not that one. <laughs> um, so just you know that student reaction. Um, the first time using these, and with the online homework system too, we would have students like they could get um, to the the paid publisher one. They could have like free access for 10 or 14 days or whatever. Mm -hmm. So some students would do that, but then if they didn't like convert in time or whatever. And so 
the first time using these, I was a little bit like you. I was like, where are all the emails of students? Yeah. <laughs> like, I forgot my login. I can't get to the material. Like, I, I don't have money for this. Can you postpone this? Can you upload the chapter of this so I can get this assignment done? Um, there was none of that. So in those first few weeks, all of those emails were just gone because everybody has access. It's all free. And like I said, the My Open Math, it's just click and go for the students. There's no login information. Integrates beautifully with Blackboard and its gradebook and everything. And so, um, so like I said, so all of all of that stuff that happens in those mm -hmm. first few weeks and all the excuses, completely gone. Um, and then like I just mentioned earlier, just the students did so much better. Um, this is a course that is we have a departmental final that we have. We give every semester. All sections take the same final, um, and so we gave last fall the same final that we had given in the spring, so that nobody could say that like we changed up the final and we made the final easier or what have you. So exact same final, exact same questions. We were just using different materials in the classroom, and the students did far far better. Um, we have a co-rec stat class here. And the co-rec passing percentage for the last couple years has been right at 40%, which sounds awful, but it's way better than what we used to do to them. Or <laughs> they went through this intermediate algebra class where only half would get through on after several tries, and then they'd go to stats, and only half of those that got through this piece would get through there. And so we always figured, you know, so 40% it's low, but it was much higher and in a much shorter period of time than before. Um, but last semester, in switching to these materials, our passing rate in that class is 60%. So for all the co-rec students, so those are all the students who are actually a level below uh, stat level to place, and we allow them to take the stat class with this one credit of extra support, um, and that passing rate jumped to 60% for those students. So. Great. <laughs> what were your biggest challenges, and or what would you do differently on your next project? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I'll start that one. So, uh, um, let's see. The biggest challenge is, I think, I think getting other people on board with it is still the biggest challenge and was the biggest challenge. The idea that uh, this, because you have to do work to get this thing ready, and the OER uh, grants provide some support for that. Um, but if you have people with experience working with publishers, the you know, type of compensation that the publishers can provide is so much greater mm -hmm. that that can sometimes turn people off to doing this work if they're not really like believers in in, in the project. Um, so so that that continues to be a challenge. I think the next time when we go with the next project, I think we even before approaching other people, you have to kind of the people the one or two people who are really excited about it and want to do it, need to kind of set up a plan of this is what everybody's going to do. This is the work that needs to be done. This is what we can do. This is what you have to do. So people have a really clear idea of what's going to be required. Um, I think there's still a lot of fear, not so much in finding material, but in the amount of work that's required in putting a resource like this together or finding a resource and editing a resource, um, something like that. So I think that's the that's what I would say was a challenge, a challenge going forward. Well, I think we're fortunate here at Harper because that challenge is for anybody who goes down this road and this kind of, um, I don't want to really use the word pressure, but that's the only one that's coming to mind at the moment, uh, kind of pressure on lots of uh, faculty at other colleges and so on to move to OER materials. But the, And it's going to take work, but there's no funding there to do that. So. At Harper, I think we're very fortunate because we've got Dave. <laughs> and Dave's got purse strings, too. <laughs> uh, we, we are fortunate that we have a board that is willing to support the development of OER. And our experience with OER has now shown that it's cost effective to the institution. We're seeing a return of something like 5 to 1 now. Uh, the board has put in $150,000 toward uh, OER development. Uh, we have generated in tuition something higher than $250,000 in actual gain to the college at the same time that we save students for million, over a million dollars in textbook costs. Uh, 
by seeing students save money and then turn around and spend it on Harper classes is really going to help us continue to support this effort in the future. And that's the incentive, and I think that's what we need to get out in our yeah, OER campaign. Absolutely. Other schools should, should know. Yeah. That, okay. Maybe that's one, the one way I also I would answer to something differently on the next project, is I would like a next project to involve more um, broad cooperation in different institutions. So rather than trying to put something together just for Harper, mm -hmm. I'd like to get a group of people like-minded people in different institutions, different types of institutions, to work together. Because now you have you have more resources, you have more people to draw from, and you have potentially a bigger impact. Yeah. You can go for external grants and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Like the homework system is one thing that's been a struggle in chemistry. I've used my open math, um, and it's all right. But the creator, um, I think Lipman is his name, yeah. uh, has kind of specifically said, this is for math. And we're not really interested in plugging in, in other tools to make it work in other things. So it continues to be an issue to find something that works. You know, when we say a free resource, I mean, nothing's really free. We're really saying it's a publicly supported resource or a publicly hosted resource. So I, I'm not sure that that's, I, I, think OER, I think in the OER world, there's still a place for students to pay for access to something that helps them with their course. It's an issue of how much. And it would be great if we could remove the portion of that that goes to profit. Like if we could just not have people profiting off that, that's OK, even if it's not free mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. And I think on that same note, from a faculty and staff perspective for professional development, when you're trying to learn new technologies, I think having resources that are low cost or free for our faculty and staff to continue to develop their skill set so that they can provide this service to their students is a huge importance at the college as well. All right. Any final thoughts? Anyone? Something that, wow, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess if anybody's listening, um, I mean, I know if you're, you're still there. You're still there. <laughs> if you're interested in any of the stuff that I've done and you want me to like show you how to do it or help you with it, I'm always happy to do that. So come find me. Same here. Right. Yeah, likewise, um, I'll, I've heard from other faculty that, um, you know, InterPsych is a requirement for various programs, and I sometimes get asked, you know, what textbook do you use or something like that. Well, it's now all free, so if anybody um, needs to know, you can access it without anybody's help. So. Great. All right, uh, just a couple of thoughts from uh, my perspective, and that is that we are still finishing up. Uh, we have some money left for this year's OER grants. Uh, we're looking at a deadline of the end of the month, so the end of next week. So if you are watching this right after the recording, uh, you still have an opportunity to submit your OER project idea for funding. And uh, any of us here, any of us in the academy would be uh, glad to help you with your project. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Melissa. All right. Um, and so at this time, we're just going to walk a little closer. So um, at this time, I really want to thank Dave and all of our panelists. This was fabulous. And thanks to all of our attendees in person and our attendees online. Um, so as Dave mentioned, there will be a webinar recording. So we'll make this recording available along with the slides and the related resources. It will be on TIFF and the Academy for Teaching Excellence webpage. Um, again, I want to thank the Tech Week Planning Committee for their help in bringing this panel together um, and who made all the Tech Week events possible. So, um, with that, have a fabulous day. Can I just, I also want to thank all the technology support staff that we had helping out with this webinar. They went through a lot of effort to make sure this ran really smoothly for us, so I want to just thank them. Yay. <laughs> right. And with that, thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.